Okay, we're going to start. So, um, I have the really awesome and somewhat perplexing privilege of introducing the, this amazing woman before us. And um, I've known Carol since she was here fleetingly uh, over a decade ago. And I, I guess I want to say before we get into all the, the myriad publications and accomplishments and that Carol Stabile is a force of nature and an inspiration. And really, I should just leave it there. I think I will. <laughs> Best introduction ever. Um, thank you. Being back here um, has really made me realize um, what I gave up in leaving. I really feel like I had some of the best colleagues in the in the world at UWM. Um, but instead of launching into my talk, um, I want to field a question um, from a graduate student that came up at the end of last session. And I want to do it so I don't forget. Um, this is from a graduate student. This is wonderful. However, can we agree that many faculty members here are beautiful exceptions, thank you, to the stereotypical isolated professor who won't assist students in maintaining their mental health? How can we reach individuals who don't take advantage of suicide prevention training or making themselves aware of resources that will set students up for success? Is there a way to standardize a curriculum for professors to make them aware of things like mental health awareness and trauma-informed care? Thank you. Um, and I'll just say quickly and then see if people here on the ground have a better answer than what I have. Um, and, and that is that um, as a department chair, I made suicide prevention training mandatory for my faculty members. Um, I actually didn't even tell them it was on the agenda <laughs> because I was worried if I told them on the, it was on the agenda that they wouldn't come. Um, so I had the folks come and do a session. It's not perfect, but it was a way of reaching them. I think you could also designate people in departments who are kind of point people, who care about these issues, who do the trainings, and who are informed, who can um, serve as resources for other faculty. Um, but is there anyone else who wants to add anything to that? Because I think that that is really important. I think that um, for me, the most important aspect of the training was really learning how to identify threats, but also how to identify resources that I could put students in touch with, and, and faculty as well. OK, we'll think on it. And if you think of anything else, you can come back to it in the Q&A. OK, um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about issues that are incredibly important to all of us. I want to thank the panelists on the session beforehand, because you touched on a number of issues that I'll touch on, probably not as eloquently um, or adequately. Um, and thank you all, those whose labor made it possible for me to speak here, especially Maureen, Nadine, Richard, and Rachel. And thanks to this wonderful audience for listening um, to me today. I should say, full disclosure, I am no longer the director of the Center for the Study of Women in Society. Um, and I say that sheepishly because I'm now an associate dean. Um, so I thought it was, it was good to, to kind of flag that positionality. OK, so before I start, from the Kavanaugh hearings to surviving R. Kelly to leaving Neverland, I just want to say that it's been a long year especially for many of us in this room. Um, I'm reading a paper today rather than presenting because I don't trust my brain when it comes to talking about some of these issues, and also because I'm really pissed. Um, and that doesn't help me focus either. Um, if for any reason you don't think you can deal with hearing and talking about these topics today, please feel free to leave and take care of yourself. I think it's really important to say that. Um, the lecture is being recorded, and you can always watch it later. And remember, there are resources to help you on campus at the Norris Health Center um, and also the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-HOPE. And they can connect you to resources in Milwaukee. So imagine the following scenario. You take a job with a boss reported to be brilliant. It's a huge leg up for you career-wise. But as soon as you start, your boss requires you to spend countless hours either in their presence or communicating with them by voice or video call, text, and or email. 
If you don't respond immediately, your boss berates you, expecting you to be available at all hours of the day and night and to schedule your life around their wants and needs. In addition, your boss forces you to distance yourself from friends and family, and they often burst into a jealous rage when your attention is not fully devoted to them. Knowing what to do in a situation like that is complicated, especially for workers just starting out in their careers who lack comparative experiences or don't have the resources necessary to extricate themselves and find another job. But what happens when your boss is your dissertation advisor, as it is in my opening example, which is drawn directly from the complaint filed by former New York University graduate student Nimrod Breitman against Professor Avital Renell in August 2018. The complaint provides details of a Title IX report that found Rennell responsible for sexually harassing Reitman. The case elicited a firestorm of media attention, as has always already been referred to, when academic superstars like Judith Butler, Jack Haberstam, Joan Scott, and Slavoj Žižek submitted a letter to NYU defending, defending Rennell. In it, Rennell's defenders asserted, we testify to the grace, the keen wit, and the intellectual commitment of Professor Rennell, and ask that she be accorded the dignity rightly deserved by someone of her international standing and reputation. One of the signatories to the letter, Zizek, added, when on numerous occasions I overheard critical remarks on Avital, it was unmistakably obvious typical Zizek fashion, that the disturbing element was her unique persona so far from the politically correct mixture of polite coldness and fake compassion. Today I'm going to use Reitman versus Rennell as a springboard for a meditation on the operations of power and gender in academic workplaces against the backdrop of ongoing economic, generational, and intellectual shifts. Um, and across three overlapping areas in the academy, um, the economic, the ideological, and the intellectual. Uh, I start by discussing the structural position of graduate students in systems that treat them in equal measures as apprentice and wage laborer. <clears throat> then I turn to the romanticized notions of genius and the stardom that hold this system in place, often serving as alibis for behaviors that would be seen as liabilities and cause for dismissal in many other workplaces. Finally, I consider the relationship between certain forms of critical theory and misogyny and how these theories provide both strategies and justifications for continued harassment and abuse. Um, as you can see already, this is very much a work in progress, and I'm eager to talk to you about these ideas. Um, I'm still, I'm getting over a cold, so if I sound a little froggy, you understand why. <coughs> Excuse me. The professoriate is full of magical thinking and relationships bound up in mystical forms of power and privilege based on unspoken rules and practices. Nowhere is this mysticism more evident than in relationships between students and faculty mentors. I confess, I wish I had more time to here today to think about undergraduates, because thinking about economic privilege and sexual harassment can help us rethink the metaphor of the pipeline in STEM fields, not as a kind of voluntarist flume that shoots students into professions, but as an aging water main in which leaching forms of toxic masculinity in physics, computer science, math, and other fields cause, cause women and people of color to exit these fields permanently. Typically, we think about pipeline issues as issues of capability and not climate. Um, for example, women and students of color have poorer skills coming into these fields. It's about time that there was more research on the role that sexual harassment and overt discrimination play in students' exit-taking strategies. Nevertheless, however unsatisfactory, undergraduates have options. They can change majors and ultimately complete degrees. Graduate students don't have those options when, ex when they experience conflicts with advisors. They come to programs often to study with individual faculty members, sometimes those with a reputation for genius or stardom, and thus the kinds of networks they hope will help them find employment. Once they accept an offer, graduate students also don't have a lot of control over how they work with faculty. In STEM fields, graduate students work in their advisors' labs. Advisors hold the keys to their future. In the humanities and social sciences, advisors recommend students for plum teaching assignments, research and award opportunities, and networking to help them on the job market. Advisors across all fields conduct research with students, co-author articles, and provide institutional instruction and mentoring. 
In all of this, graduate students are caught between two opposing systems, a feudal system that often treats them as magicians' apprentices, whose duty it is to absorb the knowledge of their masters, and a capitalist system that treats them as a contingent labor force deployed in the service of institutional priorities made even more capricious by the ongoing defunding of higher education. The feudal system creates relationships between faculty and graduate students, advisors and advisees, mentors and mentees, employer and employed based on sets of opaque rules. Criteria for evaluation are often unclear, a problem also true of this tenure system more generally. What constitutes satisfactory progress within some degree, degree programs is built on shifting standards and modes of assessment. Graduate advising is neither adequately valued nor evaluated, and graduate students often gain in information about advisors through back channels and in whispered conversations with their peers. To question the system, moreover, is to admit that one is outside of it. To complain about inequities is not only to perform one's exteriority, it's to confirm one's own exclusion in the eyes of those charged with evaluating one's performance and thus determining one's future. If you have to ask about the rules of this club, you probably won't meet the criteria for entry. Moreover, the system itself shields bad actors from complaints. Say you're a graduate student in a lab, probably not the case with many graduate students in this room, but we'll go with the example. Your PhD advisor is having a relationship with one of the undergraduates in the lab that's impacting morale and climate. All avenues of complaint jeopardize your future in the lab. You can complain to the professor and risk alienating them. You can, if you're unionized, file a grievance, providing that the behavior violates your contract. But this similarly escalates the situation in potentially catastrophic ways. If you do report, chances are you will suffer some consequences, a bad or tepid letter of recommendation, poor mentoring, and subtle forms of retaliation. You can't go to another lab, moreover, because you've already been collecting data and you came to your institution to work with a faculty member with expertise in your very specific research area. The system of apprenticeship shields faculty bad actors in several ways. Not only does it mystify the profound disparity in power between graduate student and faculty member, it romanticizes the genius of the faculty member whose role it is to impart wisdom and knowledge to their students. I remember one advisor in my department telling a student that he was thinking the unthought. Um, the modern sense of genius, that's, that is absolutely true. The modern sense of genius comes into being, not surprisingly, during the long 18th century as an exceptionally intelligent or talented person or one with exceptional skill in a particular area of art, science, etc., or a person having genius. To be a genius is to never have to explain oneself. Instead, genius appears in the guise of inscrutability and seduction, like any series of brooding, impenetrable, Hollywood-leading men. Genius means never having to say, to explain your behavior or say you're sorry. Genius is moreover eccentric, a fact that gives him license to behave outside of norms and codes of conduct. As 17th century poet John Dryden put it, extraordinary geniuses have a sort of prerogative which may dispense them from laws. <laughs> Now, the very notion of genius is elitist, rooted in thinking about intelligence or talent as either genetic or God-given, something mysterious and predetermined, rather than the result of myriad forms of economic, racial, and gendered privilege. As a concept, genius has long been an alibi for the exclusiveness of intellectual and creative fields. If genius is innate or natural, then that must mean that the whiteness and maleness of, say, the Nobel Prizes isn't the result of practice and processes of genius, but some kind of natural selection. In the media industries that I study, genius has long provided excuses for sexual violence, enshrining misogyny on screen and set alike. Um, in the work of filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock and Howard Hughes, to take just two examples. In academe, long-standing problems have been revealed over the past few years in humanistic and STEM fields alike. Um, in neuroscience, Beth Ann McLaughlin, founder of Me Too STEM, has made a practice of publicly displaying the names of National Academy of Science members who've been sanctioned for sexual harassment. In medicine, the serial sexual abuse perpetrated by, perpetrated by supposed geniuses like Larry Nassar 
and USC gynecologist George Tyndall have resulted in nearly a billion dollars in lawsuits. Now, in critical theory and cultural studies, genius and what some have described as the academic star system, which might be better described as a form of celebrity status, relies on the production and circulation of reputational capital. Rooted in post-structuralist theories and the generational zeitgeist that produce these, a certain performance of philosophical genius is a password for entry. These are anti-empiricist fields that borrow the cloak of the political, but enjoy the enormous luxury of endlessly deferring meaning, engaging in elaborate interpretive undertakings without accountability to the materialities of context or actual struggle. In these areas of knowledge production, celebrity status is built on inscrutability and a kind of professionalized obscurantism. It, moreover, to achieve celebrity status requires acolytes, else how's a reputation to get made, much less reproduced. The apprenticeship system in academe provides free labor for such undertakings. Acolytes hang on the words of their masters, either because they will be punished if they don't, or because there are institutional rewards for doing so. They cite them. They devote panels and conferences to the importance of their work. In a word, they, reproduce, repu they produce reputational capital and create legacies. And in order for the system to reproduce what Donna Haraway once described as, a sacred, as sacred images of the same, or lineages that stretch from Freud to Lacan to Althusser, or Spinoza to Deleuze to Grossberg, or Heidegger to Derrida to Renell, um, or Kant to Schelling to Zizek, I could go on and on. Um, students have to be recruited into those. This recruitment process is a form of social stratification where students are either lifted up or sorted out. As is the case of social stratification more generally, those who start with more capital succeed at a game requiring substantial economic and cultural resources. What I'm calling professional obscurantism is central to the creation of reputational capital. As Avatar Renell wrote, to make things perfectly clear is reactionary and stupefying. The more elliptical the utterance, the more it demands attention and interpretation, the equivalent of a person who intentionally speaks softly so as to make people strain to hear him. The more there are people who get it or pretend to get it, the more successful the game. Opposition or resistance is ridiculed or suppressed. To demand clarity or explanation is to be rendered reactionary, stupefying, or neoliberal. The brilliant French philosopher Michel Ledoux, raise your hand if you've read Michel Ledoux. Oh, so sad. I'll come back to that. Um, she described this process thusly. One often sees the masters teaching either in a preparatory class or a university, choosing followers. That is to say, transmitting a flattering image of themselves to some of their pupils. This attitude is part of an important process of overstimulation, which organize a future takeover and which indicate, often precociously, those who are going to feel called, and in fact are, to play a so-called leading role in the philosophical enterprise. The teacher's sexist and sociocultural prejudices take on a considerable importance in this period of philosophical apprenticeship. Many women are aware of the unconscious injustice of numerous teachers, young men who have been selected, quote, followers, often, moreover, for obscure reasons, while women constantly have to fight for recognition. Incidentally, the personal involvement of teachers in this search for an heir apparent needs to be analyzed. So, um, so the relations of elitism and domination associated with genius derive their power from modes of thought and the logic used to justify those thoughts, however much their authors work to deny that they have a standpoint at all. Um, in contrast, theories of standpoint and perspective forged between Marxist theory and various forms of feminist thought, <clears throat> black left feminism, Marxist feminism, French feminisms, insist that the material standpoint of producers shapes perspectives. Perspective thus is embedded in structures of logic and abstract thinking. Speaking of Martin Heidegger, Pierre Bourdieu advised us to, quote, abandon the opposition between a political reading of 
of in a philosophical reading of Heidegger's work. This opposition, he argues, allows for an alchemical transformation that protects the philosophical discourse from direct reduction to the class position of its producer. So where a political reading of Heidegger would see his Nazism as being rooted in his philosophical, philosophical framework, a philosophical reading would, in a more new critical style, alchemically transform his Nazism into mere veneer peeling away his philosophical framework from its material conditions of production. I think a similar alchemical transformation protects theoretical discourses from being connected to the privileges enjoyed by their producers. There are reasons, for example, why Heidegger and Nietzsche are the favored philosophers of white supremacists and Marx is not or why psychoanalysis in androcentric French philosophy, from Freud to Jacques Lacan to Althusser de Zizek to Avatar Ronel, had provided justification and strategies for sexual harassment in the academy, and the work of Bell Hooks and Michel Ledoux is not. So I want to turn to an example and try to bring together the threads of my uneven um, meditation, this notion of apprenticeship in academe, genius and excuse for bad, its excuse for bad behavior, and this alchemical transformation that severs a connection between the producer of theory and the theory produced, um, to talk about how they preserve the fundamental elitism and symbolic violence of systems of knowledge production and education. <coughs> excuse me. There is perhaps no better or more controversial example of how this alchemical transformation functions with regard to practices of abuse and exploitation than psychoanalysis. It's broadly accepted in psychology and psychiatry that Freud and Freudian psychoanalysis aren't just out of date. Freud, it turns out, could not have been more wrong about pretty much everything. I'll leave it to others to criticize the many scientific shortcomings of psychoanalysis. My point involves its epistemological foundations. As many of you know, the research that shaped Freud's theories of the psyche grew out of his work with female hysterics. At the time that Freud was conducting his research, there was much growing discussion of sexual violence in families, typically but not exclusively perpetrated by fathers or other male intimates. In the early 1890s, Freud was initially persuaded by his patient's testimony that the symptoms of trauma he was seeing in patients resulted from their having been sexually abused by family members or other trusted caretakers. But he quickly backed off this unfortunately named seduction theory, abandoning a theory based on observation for an interpretive approach that saw the unconscious as reflecting the fantasies of women and children rather than their actual experiences. Freud's need to believe that sexual violence was not endemic in families proved too powerful, so he adjusted his theory to accommodate his belief that fathers and not their victims were, be, were to be believed. Now, the ruinous effects of Freud and his disciples on Western cultures, from the homophobic critiques of momism in the 1950s to its reinforcement of the gender binary to the Monaghan Report's pathologization of black womanhood to a wide ranging of slut shaming, victim blaming ideas that continue to dominate the internet, remain to be fully chronicled. Here, I'm more interested in the fact that psychoanalysis's theory of the unconscious was built on the assumption that women, and I might add a whole host of feminized others, could not be believed. They do not know the truth of their experiences. Indeed, to get at that tru truth, one needs the analyst to interpret and ultimately, ultimately negate the words of those attempting to bring into language their trauma and pain. The resulting mode of inquiry is a tempting tool. It elevates the analyst or critic who knows the truth of other people's statements and experiences and can interpret these, those utterances even when the analyst's and is considered too dim-witted or unaware to do it themselves. And in privileging the perspective of the virtuoso reader or critic, it also provides a rationale for discrediting challenges to its own interpretive authority. Those who would criticize or disagree have repressed their real desires, etc. Indeed, the analyst is God in this scenario, remote, objective, infinitely wise, and imminently believable, while those who are analyzed are rendered mute and illegible, their motives muddled and unbelievable. There's no final instance here, no place where the theoretical rubber meets the materialities of the road. 
just an interpretive loop predicated on a ceaseless deferral meaning. Now, the case of Avatar Renell illustrates a problem stemming from these intertwined cases, themes of apprenticeship genius and theoreticism. It's not the only such case. Um, it's the best known one, um, but there are many others, and I'm happy to talk about those in the Q&A. Um, a professor of psychoanalysis, continental philosophy, and high theory, Rennell had a stellar pedigree from elite institutions. She attended one of the oldest prep schools in the US. <clears throat> Excuse me. She graduated from Middlebury College. She got her PhD in German from Yale, or from Princeton. She studied in Paris after graduation, was fired from the University of Virginia, and then taught at UC Riverside and UC Berkeley before being hired by NYU in 1995. She reportedly charmed Jacques Derrida by introducing herself as metaphysics at a gathering in Paris. Um, peppered with references to Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Derrida, her work seemingly mesmerized faculty. That she was a woman writing about Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Derrida hinted at feminist credentials. Although news accounts of the Title IX investigation brought against her in 2017 describe her as renowned, much of that reputation had to do with her connections to a cosmopolitan group of intellectuals, again, especially Derrida. Graduate students indeed wanted to go work with Renell, to be close to her, to be part of the inner circle who got what she was doing. And she actively cultivated this circle groomed those students and took advantage of desperation engendered by bleak job prospects. To benefit from her star capital meant to submit to her process. Professor Rennell's screening practices read like a how-to manual for weeding out all those who might question or refuse her theoretical framework. If you refuse to participate in building her reputation, she would remind students that she could, quote, make or break their careers by activating her network of, quote, professional and, per and personal connections. Reitman, the man who filed the complaint against her, quote, was advised by various other faculty and students in the department to power through and lay low if I wanted to have a career. In fear of retaliation and retribution, I decided to stay in my chosen program. In the academy, genius like this works through glamour in the old-fashioned face sense of that word. Geniuses are seductive, charming, manipulative. They make people believe in the emperor's new clothes because to not believe is to, be, is to risk being lumped in with the alt-right, dismissed as neoliberal, or to be rejected as homophobic or anti-sex. In their efforts to deny the power differential underlying the relationship between Rennell and Reitman, Rennell supporters rushed to defend her behavior as evidence of queer kinship in camp, underlining Reitman's privilege as a white man and a PH2 student in a notoriously elite NYU program. But try as they might, and as many more astute critics than, than I have pointed out, in blogs and tweets and Facebook posts, Rennell's defenders could not deny the asymmetric relations of power. These power relations and their coercive system of rewards reinforce other historical exclusions. And, and Rachel um, spoke eloquently to the, to the beginning. Um, for students of color, who in many cases aren't the favorite demographic, for many queer students, who often aren't constructed as objects of desire, for married or partner students who can benefit from these networks, for all first generation or economically disadvantaged students who didn't have the resources of time or capital to engage in elaborate forms of seduction and intimacy. Um, this last point, Corey Robin has effectively made in a series of essays on sexual harassment in the Chronicle of Higher Education. In academe, access to institutional power has long resided in the hands of privileged white men. But we forget, I think, at some risk, that as the professor professoriate has become somewhat more diverse, people from historically underrepresented groups have been socialized into these relations of power. Taught to believe that genius has license and is above the law, they want access to the forms of power they learned as graduate students and junior faculty, often at the feet of male geniuses. Laura Kipnis describes this process vividly in the following passage from her book on, quote, sexual paranoia. I recall another teacher, a Marxist Freudian bodybuilder, who I'm pretty sure never published anything and was reputedly sleeping his way th through a swath of the student population, who influenced me more than any other teacher before or since. The ideas I first encountered in his modern art history class shaped the entirety of my intellectual repertoire. One day I got up the nerve and asked him out. He said no. 
I was mortified but managed to gather what small shred of self-regard remained and kept going to class. I wrote a wildly speculative final paper he praised effusively, one that contained arguments that I'm still working on to this day. Note the justificatory maneuver Kipnis makes in this, which is characteristic of her book um, on the whole. Her nostalgia for, quote, drunken parties where students and teachers got, quote, plastered together. The professor sleeping his way through a swath of the student population, which I'm pretty sure was not that popular either with students or their parents in the late 1970s when Kipnis is finishing her degree. All of this is justified by Kipnis's own failed attempt at seducing excuse me, seducing the professor. He seduced students, she unsuccessfully tried to seduce him. And the outcome is a rosy one. He praises her wildly speculative paper effusively and she continues to benefit from his insights. It's interesting to me that few students have rallied to defend either Rennell or Kipnis. Um, in fact, to raise the issue of sleeping with faculty members among grad undergraduates and many graduate students is to elicit not groans, groans, not of pleasure, but of disbelief. On college campuses, arguments about sex radicalism have vocal proponents among faculty members. Um, and it's important to emphasize that critiques of Kipnis and Rennell are not the result of a conspiracy of anti-sex feminists, as much as they would like to cast this as a rehashing of the pro-sex, anti-porn debates of their youth. No, the defense of forms of bad behavior by post-structuralist theorists, some of them feminists, some not, are not reducible to generational confusion between older folk who grew up in a presumably more liberatory era and younger folk who want, want rules and guidelines. If anything, there are a clash between those who were socialized into a system where the expectations governing mentoring were often exclusionary and unhealthy, and who are seeking to preserve those privileges for themselves. Today's more diverse, slightly, professoriate, with more women, people of color, and first-gen PhD students than ever before, is challenging these ways of thinking, as have the realities of the post-2008 economic recession. Groups of graduate and undergraduate students who've only recently gained entry to the professoriate and have done so moreover during a prolonged period of educational disinvestment do not have the luxury of distance from economic necessity. As Corey Robin points out, these students and the excellent faculty members who toil in public institutions um, to demystify the student, the system, and help their students succeed in a system where jobs are highly competitive and difficult to secure, can ill afford to play games of romance and seduction. Despite discourses of their practitioners about the erotics of power, about lighthearted fun and play, about the mutuality of desire that they alone can diagnose, thinking about students in, as apprentices and ourselves as magical mentors, parental confessors, and intellectual stars masks inescapably and intransigently asymmetrical power relations. In love with romanticized images of the self, stars project their desires onto a compliant, eternally silent student population. Notably absent in these discussions is a discussion of consent. It's funny that we spend so much time trying to teach undergraduates to understand consent, but none at all when it comes to adults, even when their understanding of consent is incomplete, antiquated, and coercive. But to talk about consent means to empower others and not pursue one's own desires. And it also shatters the illusion that critiques of faculty sexual harassment of graduate students emanates from an anti-sex radical position. In fact, kink and poly communities have a lot to teach us all about the nature of consent. And some of the most interesting policy work around consent is coming out of places like kink.com. In the end, we're left with a contradiction. As feminist writer Katha Pollitt observed to Rennell, Rennell's work strikes me as a big bowl of word salad. But I understand that the general project of deconstruction is the analysis and dismantling of conscious and unconscious structures of power. How odd, then, that these professors could see domination operating everywhere except the one place they could actually do something about it, their own relations to students. But it's not at all odd, really. Theoretical clarity is not a hallmark of genius. To talk about disparities of power is to burst romantic bubbles of a very self-absorbed desire, to dispel the illusion that power is somehow sexy only insofar as it's unacknowledged as such, and to make visible the vast divide that remains in access to it. Thank you.
Did anyone have any revelations about the question before? No? Okay. Can you ask it again? Oh, yeah, I'm glad to. Um, this is wonderful. However, we, can we agree that many faculty members here are beautiful exceptions to the stereotypical isolated professor who won't as assist students in maintaining their mental health? How can we reach individuals who don't take advantage of suicide prevention training or making themselves aware of resources that will set students up for success? Is there a way to standard <coughs> losing my voice, to standardize a curriculum for professors to make them aware of things like mental health awareness and trauma-informed care. Thank you. Yes? Well, um, I know in my own work as a teaching assistant, um, oftentimes I'll see patterns in students' performance, like um, I'll see a student missing multiple assignments, yep. and then I'll talk to them either in person or through email, and then, oh, why thank you. <clears throat> As I was saying, um, I'll talk to a student uh, either in person or through email, um, and I'll, I'll, share, I'll share with them some of the resources they can take advantage of and uh, make sure that they're getting back on track in the program. Um, so that's how I promote the maintaining your mental health, just being aware of um, people's patterns uh, if they're experiencing problems and just reaching out to them. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more we can do to be a bit more proactive and um, do something that um, where it's not necessary to find these patterns, you know, start with um, sharing these resources. And um, uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there. I think that's super important. The staff that I work with in counseling at UO tell me that, you know, fa we're as faculty members, as teachers, we're often the first people to observe the patterns because we're seeing the students way more regularly than the advisors are, or the counselors are. And so, in a lot of ways, we're first responders to their healthcare emergencies. So, I think, I think you're right. Also, knowing who to reach out to. Right, educating ourselves, like if we have a student who's missed consecutive classes, right, or if we have a student that we know is struggling, um, who can we reach out to to help them? What are the resources we can put them in touch with that might help them, you know, act, succeed in our classes? Mark. Yeah, I also wonder if. Um, hello, microphone. I also wonder. I also wonder. Hello. I also <laughs> wonder if um, normalizing it. Uh, if, if forgive my um, use of that word, but um, just presenting it as matter of fact, the same way that gender pronouns have become yeah. kind of common practice, introducing themselves in that way, so that the the kind of mental health resources are just like this is what we do. We go over the syllabus. These are my office hours. This is where you go if you need help. These are my gender pronouns, etc. Yeah. This is the schedule of, of the semester. I think that's really smart, too. I had a student who I didn't realize how much she was struggling until the final exam. And I sat down with her because she was the last person in the room when everyone had left. And she was so ashamed of asking for help. And that's what she kept saying to me. I was like, you shouldn't have to struggle this way. There are people can, who can help you with your anxiety around taking tests and, and stuff like that. You shouldn't, you know, I said, I wear glasses because I can't see the world <laughs> unless I have glasses. And I'm not ashamed, right, that I have to wear glasses to be able to look at the world in a particular way. So I think reaching out to people and just understanding how much stigma there still is around getting help. I have them watch videos about how to ask for help. It's like, oh, here's a video about how, why it's good to ask for help, and here you can, here's a script for how to ask for help. So, um, hi, hi, thank you again for your talk. Thank you. Um, with regards to that, I think also that um, a lot of what you spoke on about dismantling this sort of power structure yeah. um, can be kind of integral to that. Um, and things like, you know, listing uh, resources right at the beginning and saying at the beginning of the class, like, hey, this is, these are the ways I can help you. These are the resources that I can connect you with. I think that does do a bit to kind of dismantle that power structure and even out that um, gap there. So. Yeah, well, and I think and this goes back to the issue of gendered labor. 
I was telling some people I was at this really depressing dean's conference last week. Um, talk about like the pedagogy of the depressed. Um, and <laughs> you can have it. You can have it. I got that from a graduate student, Alan Larson, years ago, and I always mention his name when I say it. Um, and and at this at, at the session with with these people, there were some folks in STEM fields who were talking about like the importance of teaching soft skills in the STEM fields, where apparently they've discovered like you can't be an asshole all the time, so you actually have to start teaching people how to be able to communicate and how to establish rapport with their students. And I pointed, I was like, what's a hard skill? <laughs> it was like, just tell me, what, what is a hard skill? Because I really need to know what that, what that is. Um, but I, I, you know, I think that's one of those places where we might do a better job of distributing labor is to say, look, these are things that teachers need to know, right? These are skills that teachers need to have. Let's not call them fucking hard and soft, right? Let's stop. Um, you know, but if we, could, if we could figure out ways to enlist other people in thinking about that, because I feel now it's still disproportionately the job of women and queer people and people of color to do that caring work. And, you know, they're not always in our classes, right? We need to figure out ways that they come into contact with these resources in other classes, too. Rachel. OK, I have a comment and a question. Yes. So I think to continue this discussion, um, for example, I had a student with some financial need the other day yeah. asked me to help her. and. One thing that has been touted very much by the administration is there's an emergency fund that students can apply for. So I went to that website and I was looking through it and like, what was not touted is how much surveillance and work it is for the student who is lucky enough to receive that thousand dollars and how much is tagged yeah. for it and how much is you have to report what you spend on food. And so I think that we have to throw this into our movement basis. Like I think <laughs> yeah. sanctuary campus has to be yep. about safety for all students. Like it starts with undocumented students and radiates outward because right. You know, our, a lot of our undocumented students have said, you know, they go to psych services and the, the psych services people are like, well, why are you anxious? You know, it's like, I don't know, ice. You know, but so I, I think that this is, some, this is not to give us all more to do, but I, I feel really, so it makes me feel really anxious about sending people to psych services because then I sat down with the head of psych services and I was like, well, how do you, how do you feel about the deportation crisis? And he was like, oh, it's really an individual matter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, <laughs> like, yeah. what? Okay, so there's that. That's just a comment. But my question is, like, I, I loved your talk. I thought it was really thought-provoking and smart. And I want to see you, uh, I want to see you pull the argument through further, because so much depends on psychoanalytic theory in the humanities at this point. And I feel like your, what the implications of your talk are pretty enormous. Mm -hmm. And that might be all I'm qualified to say, because I don't really, but I feel like the, the, I feel like you're undermining a lot of the foundations that we expect, of things we expect to be there. And I guess that's as, that's as articulate as I can be about it. But could, could you say some more? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I, I think you're right. Um, and my best way of explaining what I'm trying to do is um, to use a parallel example. So I was teaching a course maybe three years ago. It was a survey of um, communication studies. And it was the third course in a sequence for all the graduate students. And so the first two courses, I looked at the syllabi. And you know, it starts with like uh, the horrible period of psychological operations and stuff in the you know 1920s. And then you know, it's supposed to move through the contemporary era. So the first two versions of the course um, were all men, all white men, and one white woman who's a Nazi. Um, and so I was given the task of teaching the third course. Right? And, and what really disturbed me about this was that this is, the, this is the cloth out of which students create their comps and their exams. This is a cloth from which people write dissertations and cite people and create traditions and genealogies. And I thought, OK, well, maybe it's just my shitty program. And so I, I got online and started looking at, at grad syllabi for surveys in, in cultural studies and critical theory and realized that, oh my god, it's like, I, this is going to sound terrible, it's, it's like a lot of white guys until 1968, and then suddenly, you know, a few people of color and women appear 
after 1968 as if somehow they never were part of the historical stage before them. Um, so I really started thinking about these genealogies and um, the modes of thought they legitimize. And I thought a lot about Freud. You know, as you know, I just finished a, a book on the Cold War. And for me, thinking about what happened in 1950s America um, and the justification for that backlash against women, against people of color, against immigrants, so much of it was underwritten by Freudian modes of thought. And I thought, what does it mean for us as feminists and as scholars to be creating these genealogies that begin with this foundational moment that says women lie about their experiences, right? And, and then you just think about the whole sweep of it, right? Lacan, um, who is also a misogynist. Um, you think about Althusser, who strangled his wife, right? And you think about the ways in which, um, you know, misogyny and white supremacy are knit into the very foundations of those modes of thought. Um, and so, I, you know, it really turned my thinking around about, about psychoanalysis and the use of psychoanalysis. Now, parallel to that, I'll also say that um, a number of the sexual harassment cases that I've had to deal with over the last 20 years have involved people teaching psychoanalysis. Um, one of them was really, really terrible. Um, it was a case, very, very charming, charming man. You know, nowadays it was, it, I remember one moment when um, I, was, I was railing against Greek life and all the young men from Greek life came to this public hearing to criticize the feminists and they were all dressed up and they, you know, they had suits and ties on and people were like, oh, they're so charming. And I was like, Ted Bundy was charming too. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, I have to say that these were people who knew how to manipulate discourse and they knew how to make themselves be believed and believable and to kind of pull that rug out from, from beneath the, pe the feet of people um, who complained against them. And this happened enough um, where it really made me think about, you know, why people, in this case it was someone in a communication department um, who didn't have a degree in communication but had an interest in a fetish. This, I, you can't make this stuff up. Um, and it really, in retrospect, I could see the way in which um, he was using psychoanalytic theory to groom students um, and to perpetrate harassment and abuse. And I'm not saying, you know, my, my advisor was a, a psychoanalytic feminist critic, full disclosure. She's great. She's a great advisor. I really liked her. Um, and so I'm not saying all, but I, I do think that there are ways in which a theory of misogyny lends itself um, to sexual violence and so, sexual harassment. That was long-winded, sorry. Yes. There's someone in the back. earlier, and um, some things that were said on the panel and, and some things that you said in your paper, um, and, and sort of connecting to some things that Mark was saying earlier, too. Um, all of this makes me think about my role in the classroom, our roles in the classroom, yeah. um, and our kind of place in the peck mortar, and, and, and in this case, particularly how our students see us. Uh, and I think that the main shift in my thinking about my students, and I've been in the classroom for about 30 years now as a teacher, um, is that the, the older I get, the less I assume about their lives. And the more conscious I am, you know, these days of studies of the fact that I don't assume that my students have, are getting enough to eat yep. every day. Yeah. And I don't assume that they, uh, you know, that they're like on the right medications that they may need for their anxiety and depression and all sorts of things like that. And the way that that affects my role, I mean, yes, I still have material to get through mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a teacher. I have content to teach, I have process to teach, but it makes me think increasingly about, you know, those questions of what might, what else might I may be able to build in yeah. to the things I say, to the things on my syllabi, mm -hmm. to let my students know in, in overt ways that 
they, if, if they feel comfortable doing it, you know, they, they can come to me as a resource. They can know, they can maybe hope that I'm going to keep a confidence that I, I might be a resource outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, particularly because uh, I, I know that so much of this labor is very gendered and they're probably more likely to do that with a, a female teacher or maybe if they're a student of color with a, a professor of color, something like that. So just, um, and, and, I, and I think then then connects to those questions of sort of academic stardom and, and those sorts of things because it, those are really questions of, you know, what, what matters about what we do? Does it matter that we have the fanciest degrees on our walls and that we have the nicest uh, letterhead? Or does it matter at the end of the day that we might have done something that kept a student from stepping in front of a bus? No, I, I think, and I think, you know, regardless of, of our position, there are ways that you can communicate to students that you care about them. And that matters a great deal because, you know, maybe you aren't the person that they need to tell their story to or that they want to tell their story to. And I'm really cautious about um, disclosures because I often feel like I don't want students to have to rehearse their stories of trauma unless they're with people who can help them. And I feel like sometimes faculty want to absorb those stories without realizing how much it costs students when they have to tell that fucking story again and again and again. And I've sat with those survivors. So I think that there are ways that you can flag on your syllabus you know, this sense that, look, I'm a, I'm a resource. I really care about your success, and I care um, about you as a person. This is really true of graduate students. Uh, Rachel hit on this when she was talking about self-care, right? It's just saying to graduate students, why are you working so hard, right? I mean, you need to be able to set boundaries and to decide what your work life is going to look like. Um, and you need to start doing that as a graduate student. Otherwise, the job will eat you alive, right? If you don't learn how to say, it's Shabbat, right? I can't do that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about this um, alchemical, as, as you were calling Alchemical it, transformation. Right, or yeah. the peeling away of the product and the, um, and the producer. Yeah. Like the, the theories and then the, the theorizer, right? Um, and then connected to that, how you think those views, say Nietzsche's or Heidegger's, should we not teach them? Should we teach them? <laughs> yeah. Um, or I, I think the way that those courses are taught, people introduce Heidegger or Nietzsche and say, well, this is, you know, these people had these views and those views, but there's still this other, you know, philosophy that is worthy of discussing on its own. Are you thinking this is not a good idea? <laughs> that is the question, right? Um, I think that I think that we, you know, that's part of academic freedom. Is I have choices about who I teach in my classroom, and so there are, in fact, people I just I don't teach. I mean, I feel like I can't um, be objective about them. Um, also, sometimes I feel like you know, if I want to think about a genealogy in a particular way that that's disruptive. And whatever else we do, we create genealogies and traditions in our classrooms through who we cite, through who we teach. And so I, you know, Farah Jasmine Griffin has this great article about um, black feminist literary criticism. Um, so their mothers may soar and their daughters shall know their name. And she talks about citational practices in genealogy in a way that I find really helpful and really compelling. And so what I want to do in my classes is kind of trouble those traditions. And I think that there's some people who would say, well, how can you trouble the tradition without teaching it? And I think that that's perfectly respectful. Um, so I don't really, I guess I don't have a really good answer to that. I mean, I'm thinking about um, what if you were going to teach a course on, on classical Hollywood cinema? Right? Um, I can imagine ways that you could teach that that would provide a rich kind of context um, and also counter examples um, to the kind of hegemony of Hitchcock and people like that. Um, so I guess that that would be the, the kind of um, 
half-assed answer to that is that I think it depends on how you contextualize the writers and, and also how you think about the relationship between their material pr- practices and, and um, their, their philosophical legacies. I mean, yeah, I mean one, one, uh, one, um, one problem is that there, it's going to be hard to find people who are blameless, right? <laughs> I mean, there's going to be, there's a whole history of, um, you know, sexism and uh, racism and, I mean, you know, uh, who is going to be the, 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 the one to throw the, the stone, the first stone, right? So well, you, you, who are you going to teach? Yeah, well, I guess, and also, um, what's, the, what's the trajectory that you're teaching, right? I mean, I think, like, if you begin, right, with a particular kind of person, where do you wind up, or a particular philosophical tradition? If you're just teaching that tradition, to the exclusion of anything else. I think the example I gave, I gave about the communication studies course is that people are lazy and they do things the way that they've always done them, right? So it's easier probably to just teach that survey class and the way it's always been taught rather than to actually go out and say, oh, look, you know, there's C.L.R. James, who's like just freaking amazing and wrote perhaps the best book on sports in, in US history, but no one teaches him. So I do think that there, there are opportunities to, um, to enrich those canons now that we pro- and to trouble them that we probably didn't have access to before. But maybe the historians in the, the room want to, not to put them on the spot. Well, my issue is that you know, if you're going to teach somebody new, you're going to have to maybe look into I mean, into their life, right? Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. you know, you need to dig and find out, you know, do they have a history of this, a history of that? And then um, you're, you know, you might find that, you know, you can't teach well, many people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, history's messy, right? And people's lives are messy. But, but take this example. Let's say you're going to teach Adorno, right? Everyone teaches Adorno in a Frankfurt school, blah, blah, blah. Um, does anyone really teach about Gretel Adorno? and the role that she played in perhaps writing and curating Adorno's work and legacy? No, right? And that's, that is something that you could totally do, you know, is think about, you know, the, the people around those figures um, who curated and created those legacies and not just think of them as these kind of magical geniuses that appear fully fledged on the historical stage. Carrie. Yeah, I just wanted to to add to that that while it is also I think great for us to think about purging particularly heinous people from our <laughs> our various yeah. um, academic traditions, we really should not participate in the idea that we could instead replace them with a pile of innocents yeah, that's because for sure. then we are just participating yeah. in an entire system of yeah. misunderstanding how structural inequalities work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 I just, is this working? No. no. Which switch? This one? Yep. That one? So I have an, an anecdote and, and maybe something that follows from that. I've been teaching literary and critical theory for three decades, mm-hmm. uh, and I've been teaching the survey courses for a long, long time. And um, I also read Paolo Freire and think about um, how my students bring experiences that, if you value and listen to, can work through that material in a really different way. Mm-hmm. The last time I taught the survey course, the unit on psychoanalysis r- was a complete failure. Um, they were incredulous. They laughed. Um, they couldn't believe this stuff. Um, it was partly a generational thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm so shocked by how different, and Rachel referred to this earlier, how, how different 18, 19, and 20 year olds are now, yeah. how much more they know. Mm-hmm. But I think part of that comes from the fact that the academy and parents and others have worked with young women, especially on coming to voice. And um, we have now a, a literary canon about women's voices. And if you're trying to teach a a literary theory class where you're emphasizing that topic, Mm -hmm. it's really hard to teach also a unit of that that silences. 
Now, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater with psychoanalysis either. But I think if you teach it dialectically in relationship to materialist criticism and feminist criticism, you end up with something different. But ultimately, you know, you don't want to be involved in the banking style of education. You've got to be involved in this dialogue with the real experiences that students bring to the classroom every day. And, and ultimately, it's those voices that I want to hear and, and learn from, uh, and not just the voices that we read about mm -hmm. you know, in the books. And, and in that way, I, I keep learning from my students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. I think back to what Carrie said, that you know, we don't want to produce hagiographies, right? That's, that's not the point, right? Because there aren't innocents. In, in these cases. The point is to have um, a rich plurality of perspectives. And if you're teaching a course on communication studies, it doesn't include any queer people from the 20th century, it doesn't include people of color, and it doesn't include women, um, then you're teaching a really effed up kind of view of the 20th century, right? Um, and, and, and so I, I mean, I. It's, and it's also not as if I don't think we should teach Freud as part of intellectual history. I mean, you would be missing this like huge swath of intellectual history, but, but let's also think about, about the real devastation that some of these theories wreak um, in ways that I don't think, you know, I don't think Freud's really had his Me Too moment. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's big. At least, at least in my my brain, it feels big. It feels like an important an important move to make. Yeah. I'm thinking about in terms of how do you go about teaching scholars and people and theories and ideas and how do you teach Yeah. What has what has come yeah. to be yeah. as naturalized, like it was going to be this way, that yeah. just the way history was pushing us. Right. But then we're, when we teach things, I like to think about, okay, what were the alternatives that we had? Yep. Right. What were the debates that were happening? Mm -hmm. Not as like the results were inevitable, but right that there has been const contestations. Right. There were choices that were made, right, so that people see the active engagement of different actors before some idea becomes solidified and part of you know what we take as normal i love that idea of the non-inevitability -in yeah. right um because I, I was thinking a lot about that with a, like the kind of post-1968 appearance of women and people of color in these syllabi because it's like no you know there were lots of struggles in academe, in media, in politics that get shut down very quickly in the 1950s. And when we forget that, we do make it seem inevitable, right? We forget that history of struggle that's yeah. so important. So like when I'm teaching, I'm in the Black Studies Department, yeah. we teach about things like uh, Reconstruction, right? And they're like, yeah. oh, Jim Crow is just going to happen, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Right. There was a moment where we had a choice, we had a time to make a different choice, right? Yeah. Yep. And sometimes we just leave that out. You just skip over, go straight to Jim Crow, and you're like, that's the way it was going to be. Right. Right? But, yeah. if, you, yeah. but if you're teaching, you know, the, the different voices at yeah. any given time, right, then, people, then your students get to see that, that there were pressures and forces and powers right. that were pushing for certain narratives and certain discourses that then came to dominate. Right. right, but it didn't have to be that way. Yeah, and so you can see that there are, show students that there are choices. Yeah, and right? that those choices seeded things right. that were important, right, in in later periods. I, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, and I was thinking about that again with my cultural studies and critical theory um, kind of syllabus. I just kept thinking, if you're going to invent a tradition, like you should be able to do a better job of it, right? <laughs> Like, why are you going to invent a, a tradition that's like, it, first of all, it's so incredibly homogeneous, transparently homogeneous, we might say, right? Like, and you're going to do a, a whole syllabus on communication without thinking about, like, Frederick Douglass, right? Who's like the social media star of his era, right? And if you, if you, if you make him part of that communication tradition, it changes the way you think about it, right? 
it changes it changes that field of possibilities in in ways that are are really important. Thank you, everyone. It seems like that's it. You're a great audience. Just a brief reminder, there's a reception upstairs on the ninth floor of Curtain in 939. Please join us if you can. If you have lingering questions, there will be snacks and drinks. <laughs>